there is like um, um, an intermediation done by our clients. So, uh, ironically, in a world which is trying to get rid of intermediaries, here we have a new kind of intermediary. As we will see later, the role of the intermediary is not bad in any way. It is actually an enabler for more complex applications to comply. But still, as you see the, the architecture, you see that our client stays in between like the internet or a traditional data source and like a uh, blockchain, like uh, Ethereum, or like Bitcoin, Rooftop, or uh, any other blockchain really. So the role of the Oracle is the one of connecting uh, two contexts and the one of providing uh, data to the blockchain. So why would you trust the intermediary? I mean, if our client stays in between, say, an external provider of data and your blockchain application, we could tamper with the data and, for example, always win at blockeries or, you know, feed the malicious data into smart contracts, which is something you want to avoid. So this is why our clients, along with the data that is being, you know, uh, moved around, delivers the so-called authenticity proofs. So the authenticity proofs are some kind of, you know, digital evidence proving that our client is behaving as expected, so that there is no malicious attempt from us to tamper with the data and to, um, you know, provide malicious data to a blockchain application. So the way we do it is quite technical, so I don't want to dive into this, I will try to keep the presentation at high level, but what is interesting for you to understand is that there are different techniques which enable the auditability of, you know, of process executed on uh, modern uh, CPUs. So it means that if you have like uh, some critical processes that you want to execute, then uh, you may want you know, to have some kind of strong guarantees on the execution of the process. So you want to be sure that the process is executed as intended, maybe because the process is, as a result, triggering uh, payments uh, in cryptocurrency of you know, several millions. So it's something that you definitely don't want to compromise. So the way you do it is by the techniques you see in this slide. So there are different ones. Unless there are some questions, I will skip them. Um, the interesting part is that there are different uh, providers uh, providing solutions to the problem. So this is a problem that um, different uh, players have been have tried to solve for like around five years now. And the most widely known solution is the one of Intel, which is called Intel SGX, but it's not the only one. And Oracle is basically integrated with most of those to enable the auditability of the process, so to prove that we are behaving as expected. This slide is probably the most complicated of the presentation, so um, the idea is that it's not enough when you want to deal with the blockchain to use a single technology, a single type of computing technology. Because those providers uh, might you know, have some vectors or you might have the you know, security of this technology to fall apart for different reasons. So basically the way our client does it is by you know, integrating with more than one statistic group so that we can give to you a stronger guarantee. So the idea is that we don't use a single technology, we use a set of technologies, we use them together to back the result we provide. So the idea is that when you have a smart contract reaching out to an external data source via our applies, our applies will have different layers of security so that if interest checks, for example, is compromised or if one you know, flow is discovered or some zero days come out, um, for one of those technologies, you still have the security from all the others. So it stays safe and you don't have the, you know, funds in the smart contract uh, um, stolen because basically you, you you still have the security of some other layers. So the idea is to uh, use our applies as a way to abstract out all this complexity of these different technologies, but still um, to provide the final service to smart contract users without needing them to care about all these uh, technical details. So Oracle is, um, in this um, scenario is like uh, an intermediary which still, uh, I mean, is not really harming uh, the uh, blockchain anyway. Uh, we, we can't really provide wrong data because of authenticity proofs. 
The only thing we can do right now with the current kind of architecture is um, um, breaking the censorship resistance. So censorship resistance is one of the most uh, uh, crucial uh, feature of the blockchain. It means that anybody can really interact with the blockchain and there is no way to prevent them to do so. Still, when you have an Oracle like, like Oracle IS, Oracle IS is not capable of tampering with the data because of using this thing groups, but Oracle IS might avoid to answer. So there might be a situation where the Oracle doesn't answer properly and this might contract this stuff, for example. So this is why um, the, the, there are stronger you know, solutions that we are starting here, where the architecture is not managed by a single company, like in our case, but where there are other companies providing the, the same service. So in that case, you would uh, get rid of censorship resistance as well. However, you have to keep in mind that uh, data is uh, inherently something uh, that is owned by a third party. So you are always trusting data source. So it means that um, if you want to get like uh, the temperature um, in London or something like this, what happens is that you need to choose an external data source, like the Wolfram Alpha or something like this, and Oracle IS could be used to get the data from Wolfram Alpha. But still, even if Oracle IS is not capable of compromising the data, you still need to trust Wolfram Alpha, because Wolfram Alpha is uh, ultimately who provides the data. So Wolfram Alpha might be able to send back a bad result and you wouldn't be able to detect it. So this is a different problem, like the problem of trust with the data source, and you need to design applications which don't depend on a single data source, but which may be leverage more than one. So um, this is a very short piece of code. It, even if you're not a developer, what I want you to understand is that um, when you have a smart contract like this, this is like solidity. You don't need to understand it in full, but you can easily see that, like on line 23, there is a reference to an external data source, like uh, cryptocompare.com in that case. It's just an external web API, right? But what is the point here? Well, that Ethereum, in theory, enables uh, the decentralized execution of a process, which is, you know, with a global uh, unique instance. Still, when you reference external data, you're always trusting somebody. So even if you use systems like, you know, prediction markets or uh, things like this, the participants into the prediction market are, at the end of the day, they are all getting the data from somewhere on the internet, which could be compromised as well. So there is always some trust involved. Um, the, this technique, so the one of uh, you know providing of the authenticity proofs to back uh, the data fetching from web API, can be much broader and can be used also to execute the process. So it can be used uh, actually on Ethereum and on blockchains to provide some uh, scalability solutions, like uh, um, something that works today to delegate to an off-chain context the execution of some code. So this means that you can keep simpler logic on the blockchain and you can just maybe you know, move the funds or do some challenge games on the blockchain and keep all the rest of the logic outside. This is really important because today we see enterprises and many companies getting you know, huge applications on the blockchain and then they, you know, they don't go to production because the transaction cost will be too much, will be really high. So it is really important to keep the blockchain logic as thin as possible and to delegate blockchain for blockchain context as much as you can. So this is something that can be done very easily via our applies as you can like get you to this the proof for the execution of the process. And if you think this the proof doesn't uh, pass, it means there was a malicious attempt to alter the execution and you can go back on the public blockchain, challenge it and make the have a party lose some kind of collateral. This is being used today a lot to distribute uh, like uh, entropy. What does it mean? Well, it means that you have applications on the blockchain like Blockteries that wants to get random numbers. Why don't they get random numbers from the blockchain? Well, because there are not mm, basically reliable ways to get sources of randomness to get a random number from within the blockchain without having the minus to somehow um, you know, compromise or control uh, the outcome. So it's really important uh, if you want to keep the system safe to get the randomness from somewhere else where, it, where minus don't have a role or where minus uh, you know, can't do any trump running or 
where they can compromise the security of the random number generator. This is important because if they could, then the lottery wouldn't make sense. They could just steal all the funds and always win at the game or prevent our players from winning or forcing our players to lose. Uh, so in a nutshell, what they just said is that our clients can be used uh, trivially to get data from uh, web APIs, so you can get uh, the real world the information, like uh, really anything that gets distributed from a web API. Or it could also be used to trigger some action, uh, like in the real world, from within the blockchain. Like we have a blockchain smart contract, which is the only part allowed to call a given web API. And then uh, the web API gets called by uh, our applies, which is which secures everything by using this process. And what you get is maybe you know you open a lock or whatever you need to do. Um, you can also like schedule transactions for future time. This is used a lot to check, uh, for example, price changes like price fees, uh, what is the value of um, either say, US dollars, uh, or um, please check uh, every hour if there is any news uh, on uh, BBC or something uh, mentioned Trump, or um, basically anything, really. Um, and it can also be used to delegate an option uh, of off-chain auditable context the execution of a process, so that you keep on-chain uh, um, a much easier architecture and the cost of the transactions uh, is, uh, is lower. So let's look at some uh, use cases. So how can we use this technology to um, you know, implement something useful? If we look at the Ethereum public chain, what we see is that most transactions uh, there are basically moving funds from one exchange to the other, or um, you know, decentralized exchanges, ICOs, so all those use cases which are somehow related to speculation or the use or, or the use of the technology as um, um, as a currency. Um, still, there are some smart contracts uh, on the on the mainnet which are quite interesting. The majority of those, when we exclude ICOs and everything speculation related, is gambling. So we will dive uh, a bit later into why gambling is such an important use case on the blockchain. But if you look at the public chain, you will see different uh, several thousand uh, of transactions per day which um, are gambling related. And in that case, the other applies is being used to prevent uh, any cheating. So to ensure that the gambling the lottery is probably fair. On testnet and private chains, uh, where you know transaction costs uh, are not a problem, you see many different use cases, uh, ranging from you know, insurance uh, to general gaming, uh, payments, uh, banking, finance, um, different things. We will see one or two use cases uh, in few slides. Um, so the, the, the one example um, that I often like talking about because it's it's live on mainnet, even if it's, it is it is not used much because of transaction costs, is the one of uh, Etherix. So this project is basically a flight delay parametric insurance where um, you can automate the food process. Um, like you can get uh, your flight delay policy, you can buy it uh, from the smart contract directly. And there is a system where you get some guarantees on the fact that if the flight is late more than, say, three hours, then you get uh, an automated payout. So um, the logic of this application goes you know, beyond the scope of this scope. But the idea is that uh, applications like this need to get data from the real world. Because, for example, they need to check if the flight, is, if a given flight is late or not. They need to check how likely a given flight is to be late so that they can price the policy accordingly. And they need to do all this kind of check from the, the, from, from the internet. So they need like, a reliable uh, way to get data in. And uh, most of these smart contracts on the public chain, like 99% of the ones uh, needing external data, are using our applies uh, as you can verify yourself. So um, another use case that I mentioned, I want to dive a bit more, is the decentralized gambling. So in that case, you have on the blockchain, like this smart contract component, which keeps the funds. Um, and the random number generator sits outside of the blockchain, because you want to prove that you know, minus uh, don't have a role, and that uh, you know, the random number generator is uh, behaving uh, as expected, so there is no tampering and so on. Uh, the other number generator is executed within your Applies platform via a trusted execution environment. 
I'm going to apply it twice in this group. So you have some kind of guarantee which go, go beyond minus on the fact that the random number generator is fair and that there is no not, nothing malicious going on. So you, you, you in most lotteries, like I think over 60% of lotteries today on the Ethereum mainnet are using Oracleize just to get the external random number in, in a reliable way. So why is gambling a big deal? Well, uh, if you look at the traditional process, like uh, online uh, casinos, which don't use the blockchain, what happens is that they need to get a license uh, from uh, the government's gambling license. And in order to get the license, they need to get like a certificate from um, an external auditor. So the auditor must verify, for example, that the random number generator code is behaving as expected, there are no vectors, everything is fair, and that you know the random number generator is strong and it can be abused by anybody. Once you do that, yeah, like you, you put the uh, you continue the, the application for the um, gambling uh, license and you get it. So once you have the license, you just publish it on the website and people, uh, you know, players see you have the license and they believe the system is safe because you know you have the license and uh, somebody did the verification at some point. However, you have no guarantee of the fact that the system you are interacting with, like the actual casino you have in front of you, is you know the same one that is running the same code that was verified uh, by the auditors in the past. So it means that the operator can really cheat at any time and it would be really complicated for the player to prove that there was any you know alteration of the correct process. So in the blockchain space, via smart contracts uh, which enforce the correct logic, and via the use of external randomness, which could be backed by using these groups, like in this case, you get full transparency. So if you think you know and you're, somebody is cheating on you because the uh, numbers uh, are wrong and uh, you have lost a lot of um, you know um, a money and things like this, you can still verify what happened and um, you can check the test groups, you can check the transactions on the blockchain and you have the guarantee that everything went as intended and so on. Uh, so basically you can um, uh, implement a proof of the fair uh, lottery, which is almost impossible uh, without a blockchain and without a trusted computing component. Something else that banks are experimenting a lot now is um, platforms for derivatives and other financial instruments where they use the blockchain to automate some interaction processes with uh, relatively low fees and uh, with, you know, my enforcing the correct logic here. Uh, but, um, here the role of applies is obvious, like you need it to get, you know, data from uh, the exchanges to get price fits in, to delegate to an option context, maybe the execution of the pricing engine, all these kind of things. So it varies a lot. Um, it depends on the verifications, but there are several uh, derivative platforms on Ethereum, both on testnet and mainnet, that are using our applies to, um, to solve the, these kind of problems they, they, they need to tackle. Um, so this is like the end of the presentation. So just some numbers. Uh, we will be shortly presenting like in May um, in Toronto at Adcon. Uh, last year it was in Paris, so we presented there as well. Adcon one, two, and three. We, we've done several talks, and we you know we are very close to the community, so we try always to get feedback, and we would like also you know would love to get some feedback from you as well. Um, as you see, we have sent on the main chain, on the, on the main net of Ethereum over 450,000 queries um, so far. So people are using the service quite a lot. Now we are sending uh, around uh, 2,000 transactions per day on the Ethereum mainnet to provide on-demand data to these smart contracts that need um, this kind of uh, information from uh, outside of the blockchain. We have integrations also with other chain, but Ethereum uh, is where 90% of the demand is right now. Um, we are trying to stay agnostic to the technologies um, that we use to secure the platform. So we have integrations with different trust computing technologies, and we plan to keep doing so and diversifying in order to you know, keep providing a strong uh, evidence, strong proofs on the authenticity um, of the data we provide to the blockchain. We are still a small team, like uh, seven people. Uh, we are based in London, um, but 
yeah, we we always uh, you know go around the conferences, events, uh, speaking with enterprises and so on to uh, to get the feedback uh, from them and trying to reiterate the service. We have been doing this for two years and a half, and uh, the quality of the service now is quite decent, I would say. And you know, developers are finding it very useful and crucial for their uh, applications to be implemented and to be possible for their applications to go to production. Um, so the things we plan to do for the future, basically keeping, uh, you know, uh, to, to improve the service uh, so that we provide stronger guarantees. We have integration plan with Hyperledger Fabric and with other platforms as there is some demand coming there. Um, and when delegating the management of the platform uh, to a distributed system where basically even censorship resistance uh, um, is, uh, is bad. So we can also provide censorship resistance at some point. And um, yeah, this is, uh, this is pretty much it. Um, so thank you for your attention. I, I, don't, I, I think the uh, microphone on your side is still muted, but maybe if there is some question, you can like unmute it or write something in the chat. I still have uh, like three minutes available or something. Thank you. Is there any 
multiplied on integration and how different is it to integrate or apply this integration and networks, which is uh, in a different language, that is web assembly and C++. Well, the way your is implemented, most of the complexity sits outside of the blockchain in uh, the cluster computing components and in our architecture. So the integration with the blockchain is actually a very thin layer that sits, uh, you know, um, at the periphery. So what it means is that integrating with the blockchain is something um, we do very quickly. It's just a very thin layer that we need to implement every time. So regardless of the complexities or different approaches uh, of one blockchain uh, over the other, we try to integrate wherever there is some kind of demand. So now we have integrations like with Eris Monax, uh, Atricot, uh, with Ethereum, uh, with Bitcoin. Uh, of course, they are, they are all slightly different, but they all leverage the autistic groups uh, and the extension of the blockchain by trust computing techniques in a general, generalized form. So it is definitely possible to integrate a new blockchain if there is any demand, we, we, we would be very happy to do it. Well, thank you very much, Thomas. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm excited to introduce Andrew Gordon from uh, Gordon Law Firm. Uh, the tax season is here, as we all know, and we have to file taxes. And Andrew is the tax attorney from Chicago. He's a frequent speaker at Ethereum uh, Chicago meetup, and he is a with the tax parties. Welcome, Gordon. Please go ahead. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Can you see my screen or do you see me? We see both you and the screen. Okay. Oh, so we're good? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, so, uh, hi everyone. My name is Andrew Gordon. Uh, I'm actually an attorney and uh, a CPA, and I spend my time fulfilling both functions. Um, on the, the law side, we practice tax controversies mainly. So we deal with IRS uh, disputes, IRS audits, criminal investigations, as well as state disputes as well. Uh, we've been in the crypto space since late 2013, uh, early 2014. So uh, we've been involved before even the IRS uh, made their announcement and characterization of crypto, which I'll talk about a little bit today. Um, and so with that, I also say during this presentation, if anyone has any questions, I know it's kind of difficult since we're in different locations, um, <coughs> but if you have questions, feel free to raise your hand. Um, not sure how we can do it. Maybe if you type the question or even just unmute, um, and uh, I'm more than happy to address your questions as we go along. A lot of these concepts can be quite complex, so if there's anything that you want me to go into further detail about, uh, I can see you guys as well, so raise your hand and I'll stop and we'll figure out a way to ask the question. Um, so today's agenda, we're gonna go through a number of different tax topics. We're gonna to start with just some of the IRS basics. Um, how does the IRS generally view cryptocurrencies? Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about treatment of uh, income um, of, of cryptocurrencies. So when you receive cryptocurrencies or if you pay others in crypto, how is that treated? From there, we'll discuss a little bit about trading, which is more of what everyone's used to, um, buys and sells, and also exchanges of crypto from one coin to another. And finally, we'll talk generally about the tax requirements, what everyone should be aware of, um, and the different filings that are necessary, as well as answer the one question that everyone always asks, which is, how would the IRS know if I don't report my crypto transactions? So first, um, talking a little bit about the basics. Um, crypto is taxable, and uh, hopefully I didn't break anyone's heart, and hopefully that's not uh, too shocking of news to people. Um, uh, uh, people say, you know, since crypto is decentralized, um, some uh, cryptos, such as Monero, for example, or other privacy coins, uh, make it very difficult and nearly impossible to trace ownership. So um, it's not taxable. Well, in fact, it, it is uh, taxable. Um, and uh, it's taxable for a number of reasons. One is that the IRS has directly addressed that cryptocurrencies are not currency, but instead property. Um, and this occurred back in March 2014. And the IRS, uh, before that, there was a lot of debate. Is cryptocurrency, and if crypto is currency, when you exchange it, 
um, or you know, go from one currency to another, that's not taxable. When you, for example, if you have dollars and then you convert to euros, that's not a taxable event. When you use dollars by Lamborghinis, that's not taxable. So up until this point, there was debate or um, uncertainty as to whether or not crypto would be property, uh, such as uh, an asset like gold, or more akin to a currency like the US dollar or euro. Um, in 2014, the IRS uh, ruled on this, issued guidance, and said, in fact, it's property. And so along the same lines, all the general rules that apply to property apply to crypto, which means that when you purchase crypto, there's no tax there. But if you uh, sell, if you exchange, which we'll talk a little bit more about, uh, um, there are tax implications as a result. Um, a little bit about income. Um, now, as crazy as it sounds, people are being paid in crypto. Um, even uh, consultants as part of ICOs or even just contractors for everyday businesses are being paid in cryptocurrencies. And there's a couple important things to be aware of. One, it's still taxable to the employee. And the question that I'm often asked then is how much is it taxable at since the value changes all the time? Well, you determine the fair market value at the time of receipt. And whatever that value is, that is your amount of income, even if you don't convert it to fiat or cash. So if you receive uh, $5,000 of Bitcoin as compensation as wages, that's just the same as if you receive 5,000 USD and you have to pay taxes on that. Your employer has the same obligation or the employers in the room have the same obligations. They still have to file form W-2s. They still have to withhold taxes um, and the withholding is in USD, so although you pay your employees in crypto, um, you still need to pay the government in US dollars on that value of crypto. Uh, for contractors or service providers, similar, um, it's taxable, and in addition, self-employment rules apply. So if you're self-employed, there's generally an additional tax uh, that you pay as a result, and that same tax would be um, calculated on the fair market value of the cryptocurrency at the time that it's received. So say you receive Bitcoin, $100,000 worth, uh, taxes were not withheld because it's just you're a contractor and someone paid you $100,000 worth of Bitcoin. It's taxable at your ordinary tax rate. And so um, we have a graduated system in the US. So uh, everyone's tax rate in the, in the room may be different. Um, and so whatever your tax rate is, that's uh, applied to that 100,000. And so in this case, you don't have any cash. You, you owe the IRS a bunch of money on your compensation, but you only have cryptocurrencies. And so the suggestion that we generally have is whenever you receive cryptocurrencies as compensation um, to estimate the amount in tax and cash out or sell an equivalent amount of cryptocurrencies in order to pay the tax on that income. Um, so for example, if you're a, a part of an ICO and you're compensated with uh, tokens in that ICO for your work, even if it's not traded, even if it doesn't have uh, an explicit value, um, you should still, or your accountant should still make efforts to determine how much is it worth at that time that you receive it. It's probably not worth zero. It's probably not worth a penny because someone would buy it from you for a penny. Um, so it has some value, and it's important to, to determine that as well as pay taxes on it. Purchases. Uh, this is another common question. So say you take cryptocurrency, for example, Bitcoin, and you purchase something with it. Um, in the last week with the value not being where they are, there's fewer people buying Lamborghinis. Maybe I should change this uh, to a Toyota. But, uh, <laughs> but say, say you take uh, your cryptocurrency and uh, you buy a Lamborghini or a Toyota with it. And for our conversation purposes, let's stick with Lamborghini uh, at a $300,000 value. Um, and say Bitcoin is trading about 10,000. I know it's a little lower today, but say it's about 10,000. So it cost about 30 Bitcoin in order to buy this Lamborghini. You originally paid $1,000 per Bitcoin. So your cost basis, or the, the purchase price of, of these 30 Bitcoin, was a total of $30,000. So uh, by buying the Lamborghini with Bitcoin, it's as if the Bitcoin was sold, that you received the cash, and then you used that cash to buy the Lamborghini. And so in this case, we had a $300,000 sales price for both the Lamborghini and the Bitcoin. There's a $30,000 cost basis. 
that was the original purchase price of Bitcoin. So we have a $270,000 gain, which means there's tax due on that $270,000. So assume your tax rate is about 30%. Uh, and so just for round numbers, that's about 85 grand of tax due on that Lamborghini that you just bought. Um, that contemplates short-term gains and so forth. But um, this is an example of even though you're buying something with crypto, even though it's not going to fiat, it's still taxable. Um, and so, again, in situations like this, a, a good step to take is to sell some crypto or um, buy a cheaper car, leave a little bit of crypto for taxes, um, and then put that money aside uh, for taxes. Any questions about that so far? No? Okay. Trading. Um, so much like the purchase of the products, um, whenever you sell cryptocurrency or exchange it for another cryptocurrency, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but whenever you sell or trade, um, there's a tax on that. And because the IRS is ruling that cryptocurrency is property, this is actually a favorable result for some people because uh, the characterization of property allows us to have both short-term and long-term gains. Long-term gains apply whenever you hold the crypto for longer than a year. Short-term is if it's less than a year. Short-term gains are at your ordinary tax rate, which again, varies based on your income, but you know, generally between 20 and 30% uh, is your ordinary tax rate um, versus your long-term tax rate, which is at 15 or 20%. So a strategy or one of the benefits of the IRS's ruling of crypto as property is that if you hold it for over a year, you get the 15 or 20% tax rate versus the higher tax rate. Um, one of the, on the flip side, though, one of the negative aspects of this characterization is that there's limits as to the amount of loss that you can take per year. Um, the IRS limits losses on uh, capital asset to only 3,000 a year they can be netted against gains. So say in 2017, uh, certain trades you lost 10,000, but then uh, other trades you gained um, 15,000. You can take that 10,000 to reduce the 15,000 gain. You then only have a 5,000 uh, gain. However, let's say on an annual basis, all your trades combined netted a $10,000 loss. On your tax return, you can only take a deduction for 3,000. So that 3,000 will reduce other income, and 7,000 will carry forward to future years, um, but in any given year, you're limited to only $3,000 of loss that you can deduct. Um, and so another just strategy or, or thing to consider at year end is to look at your tax position, and if, for example, you have significant gains, it may make sense to sell cryptos that might be at a loss at year end in order to take those losses, harvest those losses, and apply those to the gains. The most common question that I'm asked at least once a day is what are the tax implications of going from one cryptocurrency to another? So for example, you buy Bitcoin, exchange it for Ethereum, or buy Ethereum, exchange it for Ripple, um, which is very commonly done. As many of you know, you can't buy uh, most ICOs with Bitcoin, so you can um, you can't buy most ICOs with fiat. So often you have to go into one cryptocurrency and then convert to another. There's been a, a common misconception that if you don't go to fiat, um, that it's not taxable. Um, in fact, it is still. Are you guys still with me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, okay, back on? Yes. Okay, so even though cryptocurrency, even if you don't go to fiat um, and you just go from one crypto to another, it is taxable. In the eyes of the IRS, it says if you sold the first crypto, converted to cash, and then bought the second. Now, we'll say, what about like kind exchanges? What about this thing called Section 1031? Well, a couple comments to that. Um, in general, it can apply, um, and, and only to years 2017 and earlier, which I'll get into now. But like kind of agent is most commonly we see in property, and it's when, uh, for example, um, someone uh, purchases 
uh, one piece of property and sells another piece of property, there's no gain on that sale of their property because they exchange it for another piece of property. Um, that's the most common example that, that we see. Now, people then try to apply this to crypto, and they say, similar to swapping one house to another, crypto should also apply as like kind. Well, the rules of like kind first require that the two pieces of property be what's referred to as like kind. And the IRS has never defined what like kind means. However, we can look to case law or other court cases um, about this issue to get a, a good idea of what uh, courts would generally accept. And courts look at the nature or character of the property. And an example of this is if you have, for example, a farm and then wanted to swap this for a rental condo, these are very different of nature characteristics. And so a like kind exchange wouldn't apply there. When looking to crypto, um, most practitioners would argue that most cryptos are not comparable one to the next. For example, Bitcoin to Ethereum. If you ask one of the original developers of Ethereum or ask someone that's knowledgeable about Ethereum if it's the same as Bitcoin, they'll say absolutely not. While it may use some blend blockchain technology, um, the potential uses, uh, income, even attributes such as gas, which don't generally exist, uh, in Bitcoin, there are significant differences or, uh, in the nature or character of these two coins that we believe, and most practitioners believe, that a, a court or the IRS would say these are not close enough. And when we look at different cryptos, some of these differences are even more obvious when they have ICOs have very explicit purposes. That then even diverges further from the nature of Ethereum or, or Bitcoin. So just in terms of a first characteristic, uh, our first uh, barrier that must be uh, breached in order to have a like kind of exchange, the two properties need to be very similar. I'm not saying it's impossible. I could be confronted with two different coins that are very similar, and arguments arguably could be made that um, they are of substantial characteristics that are similar. However, I have not been presented a fact pattern um, to date, and I'm probably asked this question at least once or twice a day. Um, second, one of the other requirements of a like kind exchange, which most people seem to gloss over when thinking that it applies to cryptocurrencies, is that you actually have to file a form or inform the IRS that you're taking a like kind exchange position. And this isn't just for crypto, this existed with property or anything else. If you're doing a like kind exchange, you need to file a form, Form 8824. Um, and so you're basically saying, hey, IRS, I'm doing a crypto like kind exchange. And so um, individuals that even want to take this argument, um, that's one of the steps that they have to take. Taking another step as to why like-kind exchanges typically don't apply to crypto. Um, in most like-kind exchanges, the IRS is really looking for a one-to-one -one exchange. Someone has one piece of property, someone has another piece of property, and the two individuals are going to swap. Now, in most cases, two people don't have exactly the piece of property the other person wants. And that's why in the world of real estate, um, there became the usage of something called a qualified intermediary. And in most like kind exchanges, these are actually used. It's a third party that sits in between the two, buys the property from one, buys the property from the other, sells uh, accordingly, and through the use of the qualified intermediary in the middle, they actually facilitate the exchange. So it's not a direct one-to-one. -one. I'm often asked, well, don't exchanges serve this purpose? Coinbase or Colonix or pick your exchange of choice. Does this qualify as a qualified intermediary? And for a number of reasons, uh, practitioners believe that they don't. Um, one, uh, and the most obvious, is that when you execute either a purchase or a sale order, it's often not directly going to a single um, buyer or seller. So if you buy Bitcoin, you may be buying fractions from a number of people, and it may be directly transferred depending on the exchange, if it's a decentralized exchange, it may not even go through an intermediary. Um, and so there are a number of just um, aspects of, of being a qualified intermediary that most people feel exchanges um, don't fit. Um, so those are some of the main reasons as to why we and generally all the other practitioners that I speak to uh, don't believe 
uh, like kind exchanges apply in the vast majority of situations. Again, can I be confronted with a situation where there's a wealthy individual who had a million dollars of Bitcoin that wanted to swap it for another coin that's very similar to Bitcoin, and we do a one-to-one -one transact and are using a qualified intermediary to take all the necessary steps? Sure, it's possible, but I haven't seen it yet. Um, taking that another step, um, the um, Actually, Congress recently, in passing the Tax Cut to Jobs Act of 2017, restricted 1031 exchanges to only real property in 2018 and forward. So while arguments could be made in 2017 and earlier, 2018 forward, um, it has to be real property. So it's absolute that crypto does not qualify for like-kind exchanges in 2018 um, and, and forward. So again, there's some what I call truthers out there that believe that like kind of changes still do apply. Uh, but in order to do so, there's a number of hurdles that you have to get over. Um, and in nearly all the examples, all the people that I speak to, they're not able to or they don't overcome these hurdles. Finally, the last point that I would make is Congress has said 2018 forward, like kind of changes do not apply to crypto. And so if we take the position of like kind of change in 2017 or earlier, we file the forms. Ultimately, um, we, we need the IRS either to not examine or look at the return or concur with the position. And by filing the 8824, taking the like kind exchange position and designating crypto as the property, um, you're kind of raising red flags with the IRS. And so there's a strong likelihood of, of audit or exam by taking that position. And if so, then you need the IRS to actually agree. And given that Congress has said forward, uh, it doesn't apply given the general um, nature or the general skepticism of crypto uh, by the IRS, I would find it very unlikely that the IRS or tax court uh, would add or, or qualify like kind of changes in 2017 or uh, Any questions about that? themselves are generally not taxable. So if you loan uh, one ETH um, uh, to someone in the room, that's not taxable to you, it's not taxable to them. However, what would be taxable is any interest that you earn as a result of that. So I would assume you're not loaning it to them for free, but if you are, great. And so if they return them 1.1 ETH uh, for the one that, they, uh, that you've loaned to them, you now have 0.1 of interest that needs to be recorded on uh, your tax return. Your cost basis doesn't change. That still stays the same. Uh, the anticipation is that you're going to have that Bitcoin or Ethereum return, and so that cost basis would stay with that, it would follow with it, and then also be returned to you. Now say it's, uh, it disappears, um, or that the person doesn't uh, re return the Ethereum to you, then you would have uh, a deduction. You would be able to deduct your cost basis in the Ethereum that you loaned out. Does that make sense? Okay. Any other questions? Sure. Use my It, it does. It does not affect it, and I know there are now some uh, crypto lending platforms. I think the big one that comes to mind is Salt, that requires that you collateralize your loan with crypto. The collateralization is not actually a taxable event. Um, if, however, the collateral was taken, or you know you default on the loan and then the collateral is taken, then there are taxable results that may apply. Um, however, just the collateralization itself um, won't lead to any taxable event. 
my question is more of a logistics question. Traditional patient brokers like Human, it's uh, Ameritrade, Vanguard, whatever. They issue a 1099 and they figure out all of this stuff. So all you need to do is just you know, to get back to it. Uh, I don't think any of these exchanges do that. Uh, what's uh, how how is it supposed to be used? But and the question was. Uh, like when you are trading with, uh, uh, let's say, interactive brokers or Ameritrade, at the end of the year, they gave you this form with the, all, the, all the trades you did and the profit in the last time. But none of the exchanges are doing this. So what do we, what do, we do? Sure, sure. Um, and I'll uh, kind of talk about a couple of things because I think it's a, it's a good question and it brings up a couple of different um, uh, sub-questions. So some exchanges, U.S. exchanges, starting in 2017, are issuing Form 1099-K uh, to certain users. Uh, Gemini, G, yeah, Coinbase have all done this in 2017. Some of you do in this room might have received. I believe the threshold was $20,000 um, in, um, in in deposits or transfers in. Don't quote me on the threshold, but um, these um, exchanges have issued Form 1099-K starting in 2017 and will continue to in future years. Now, what uh, brokerage institutions uh, issue is a, a Form 1099-B, and there's actually a significant difference. A 1099-K, which is what the exchanges are issuing, and under IRS guidance, they're actually required to issue, um, represents the total amount that was processed or came in through the exchange. They do not report cost basis, they do not report purchase date, anything like that. They're showing the total amount that came in. The Form 1099-K is typically used by, by credit card processors, PayPal, eBay, uh, companies like that. Um, and the 1099-K, for example, by a credit card processor, would show the total credit card transactions that came in. And so it sounds weird that Coinbase or these exchanges are using this form uh, to report transactions. But that's because the IRS actually sees them as a payment intermediary. Some people are using Coinbase to basically uh, receive payments for businesses. And so this form, regardless if you're using it for business or personal use, if it, you exceed the threshold, uh, Coinbase or other exchanges are going to report this form. The question that was asked is, well, what about 1099Bs or reporting requirements that show cost basis? Uh, Coinbase actually this week made an announcement that they have released new tools uh, to assist in tax reporting. And I caution people uh, severely against these tools because one of the, the issues that Coinbase or all exchanges have is that they have no idea what occurs outside of their exchange. So say you bought Bitcoin or bought a Ethereum on a different exchange, transferred it to Coinbase, and sold that Coinbase, how does Coinbase know what your cost basis is? How does Coinbase know if you even bought that crypto or if you were gifted it or received it as income? Coinbase has no idea. So it's difficult to nearly impossible for Coinbase to be able to report the cost basis of every item. In addition, if you use, or depending on your inventory method, FIFO or LIFO, and we've talked a little bit about that too, um, you can't just look at Coinbase in a bubble if you're using any other exchanges or wallets. So even if Coinbase one day did issue a 1099B, you can't just say that the gains or losses there are limited to just Coinbase. Um, it's more akin to Coinbase being one bank account, and if you have a number of bank accounts and transfer between bank accounts, that's not taxable, but you have to keep track still of, of what you receive and what bank account. So my belief is it's unlikely or nearly impossible that Coinbase or other exchanges are going to provide the full data that we all want. Unfortunately, they are issuing some reporting to the IRS, which um, goes to another point, which is that it's very important to report and pay taxes on your transactions because now the IRS is getting a lot of information from exchanges and the information that they're getting is the total that came in. So it's up to us to report, hey, wait, that, that may not be my gain. Um, you know, I have cost basis, there's other aspects of it, so it's, it's crucial for the taxpayer to come forward and report. I had someone only a couple weeks ago that said, on their 1099K, it showed over a million dollars, meaning over a million dollars of uh, US equivalent of cryptocurrencies went into uh, their Coinbase wallet. In fact, they had only spent 
uh, less than $50,000 on crypto because they're moving it back and forth between different exchange wallets and then back to Coinbase. Coinbase, every time it was brought in, viewed it as different cryptocurrency and issued this very large 10 k So unfortunately, um, the reports that are, are being issued are not very helpful. Um, they will alert the IRS as to activity and further, um, it's nearly impossible for the exchanges to have all the data that we want. Hope that answers your question, although it's not probably the answer you want to hear. Two other questions. One related to that. What about the transactions that you make exchanges that are uh, located outside the U.S.? And the other one, what about mine? Well, the two questions. And one is, as, as you know, there are many exchanges that are a lot of U.S. citizens, but you know there's VPN. And many of us do have accounts in various exchanges in various countries. But what about those? Uh, they're not sending anything to the IRS. And what about mining? How do you how do you report mining? So uh, there's a number of questions there, so I'll try to, to break them apart. Um, so yes, exchanges, uh, there's a lot of foreign exchanges that are not presently reporting to the IRS, and I would agree. Um, however, even taking a step back, as US persons, it's our obligation to self-report. So even if the exchanges don't report, we still need to report our gain losses. Um, now that you know, everyone uses credit card, but years ago, cash was king, and people didn't have to report, uh, I'm sorry, not all cash transactions were reported to the IRS, yet the obligation still existed to report your cash and pay taxes on it. So just as a first point, the obligation exists regardless of what the IRS knows. Now, the fact that exchanges aren't presently reporting, my strong belief is that this is going to change, and it's going to change in the short term. Um, just uh, a few years ago, um, people thought if you had money in foreign bank accounts or Swiss banks that the IRS would never know about. Um, fast forward to now, and uh, now banks across the world are providing great amounts of information uh, to the Department of Treasury and the IRS regarding bank account holdings across the world. Um, and we're seeing this happen basically with every bank. Um, and so it's my strong belief that the same thing is going to occur with foreign crypto exchanges, especially the large ones, uh, where the U.S. is going to say, hey, if you want to allow U.S. customers, if you want any um, contacts with the U.S., if you even want U.S. bank, that you need to provide us with all this information. So one answer to that is I believe it's going to happen that all these exchanges are going to provide the data. Second, regardless, the obligation is on us. And then let me tell you some even worse news. If you're using a foreign exchange, um, you should file what's called an FR and include it on a form called FAT card. An FR is a foreign bank account report. It's a separate form. Um, it's now due on the same date of your tax return, but it was previously a different date. Um, it's filed separately, and it identifies the existence of any accounts that have over uh, 10000 Oh, I'm sorry, if you, in any given year, have over $10,000 in a foreign account or a foreign exchange, U.S. equivalent, at any time, then you need to file the FBAR. Um, and this is not a taxable form. It's just a disclosure. You don't pay tax on it. But you have to identify to the IRS the maximum account value uh, in these exchanges. Now, this remains a gray area. Some practitioners say that exchanges shouldn't qualify, but to be conservative, and again, given that there's no tax due, uh, we suggest to file uh, both the FBAR and FAT form. I see a hand raised over there. Is that 10,000 over the course of the year or 10,000 at any one time? At, at any one time. So even if it went over 10,000 for a minute, so you transfer you know, uh, one Bitcoin and it went over 10,000 just at any given time and then drop back down, you still have an FBAR required. And now the question is going to be, Bitcoin prices fluctuate every second, crypto fluctuates every second, how do you figure it out? It's a pain, but it can be done. You basically just look at your account uh, history or transactions and identify generally where your maximum volume is, look at the exchange rates on those days. But so, if, can but, but, if you yep. put, but if you put 2,000 in, exchange it, pull it out your wallet, put another 2,000 in the next week, exchange it, pull out your wallet, and you do that, you know, 10, 11 times, you're okay? Can you repeat that? I didn't catch that, I'm sorry. So if you do small transactions multiple times, so let's, let's say 2,000 each for five times, or 10 times, 
does it still, the aggregate still comes, or is it just individual transactions? So it's at any given time. So it doesn't add the uh, actual transactions, but if you took a snapshot of your wallet balance, took a snapshot every second, and, and whatever that value was each second. So if uh, you're doing small trade, you know, 2,000 in, 2,000 out, balance is zero, 2,000 in, 2,000 out, balance is zero, at no given uh, specific time did it ever exceed 10,000. So there wouldn't be a requirement then. Mining. Okay. Um, so mining. Um, whenever you receive the proceeds of the, of the mining activity, that's actually income. So whenever you receive any payout, if you're part of a mining pool that pays once a day or once a week, whatever you set it to, whenever you receive that cryptocurrency, that is income and taxable at that fair market value amount. Uh, sometimes it's not easiest to determine what that value is. Sometimes you have daily averages or other things, but best efforts in terms of calculating that my, that value uh, when you receive those proceeds, and that is taxable, even though it doesn't turn into fiat yet. So say you get paid out uh, one uh, Ethereum uh, for your mining, whatever the fair market value at that time that you receive that one Ethereum, that is your income. Again, I would suggest to people to sell that a fraction of that Ethereum at that spot price in order to cover your taxes. Taking mining then another step further, say you receive one ETH, you sell 0.3 to cover your taxes or whatever it is, and then you hold the 0.7. And then a month later, that 0.7 doubles, and you sell it then. Um, now you have another gain. You've got a short-term gain um, of whatever the difference between that initial income amount was and then that sales price. So you've got the first tax on the income, and then when you actually go to sell it, um, another tax then. Um, I want to offer individuals because we were all say generally remain gray, although many areas in tax law are gray and we have to to old rules and apply current technology and current facts to the rules that currently exist. Now with respect to wash sales, generally wash sales uh, only apply to securities. Now the IRS has not said that uh, crypto is a security, they've only said it's property. Now many practitioners believe that it logically flows that crypto should be a security uh, under the IRS's eyes, since given both the SEC and CFTC and probably the other agencies I'm not aware of have all said crypto is a security, it makes sense that the IRS would see it the same way. Nevertheless, they haven't explicitly said so. Um, and so a position can be taken that wash sales do not apply to crypto, at least until the IRS has provided guidance otherwise. But this remains a uh, you know, uh, a question um, that is open. Um, I've had clients certainly, or most clients certainly take the position that wash sales do not apply, uh, meaning that every time you do have a sale and then you buy back the next minute or next day, it's not a wash sale, your loss is not disallowed. That's how I would say most people are treating it. However, um, there, it still remains a, a question um, that hasn't been answered. Now, with respect to bartering, uh, most conservative practitioners would view that the exchange of goods are still, uh, are, for example, you barter, you exchange Bitcoin for a Lamborghini, um, which could be construed as, as a bartering activity. Um, most practitioners view this as, or, or the bartering rules uh, when it applied to crypto as still resulting in taxable transactions. Um, so, you know, a, a position arguably could be taken, um, but you know, I, I don't think that that would be a winning one. Again, 
regardless of whatever you write or your CPA puts on your tax return, the IRS ultimately has to accept it if audited or scrutinized. And so taking um, you know, a bartering position, I would be very hard pressed to, to uh, believe that the IRS would see that non-taxable. So that's actually a complex question. Um, in some cases, it doesn't make a difference. It makes a, di um, a difference if, for example, you can be designated by the IRS to be a trader. Now, most people that are dealing with crypto, and arguably everyone in this room um, that is either a student or has a job, is not going to be uh, deemed by the IRS to be a trader. There's actually a distinction between an investor and trader. Most of the people there are investors. Um, if you are trading on a daily basis, you're every day executing trades, it is your job. Um, you can file an election or take a position with the IRS that you are a trader. And as part of that, you're not actually taxed on your gains or losses on every sale, but you're taxed on the uh, value of your portfolio at the beginning of the year compared to the value at the end. And if you take this approach, you can directly deduct any expenses. Say you buy a computer, you get a home office, um, whatever the expenses may be. Um, you, you have space at Enterprise Works, whatever it may be. If you're a trader, these are directly deductible because you are running a business. And to, to further benefit from some tax deductions, it may make sense to file as an LLC or S Corp. But the threshold question here is whether or not you can qualify to be a trader in the IRS's eyes. And traders um, have fought this in tax court many times. There's several cases on different factors as to whether or not um, someone's activity is sufficient enough to be a trader versus an investor. Um, and the reason that you want to be a trader versus an investor also is that as an investor, your expenses, you can't directly deduct. And this is true even if you form it as an LLC. You can't direct deduct investment expenses. They are on um, Schedule A. They're referred to as an itemized deduction. So you don't always get a dollar for dollar reduction. Um, this is different than if you had, uh, if you're a trader and operating a business, then it's a dollar for dollar. So it's kind of complex, and, um, um, and it depends on your trading activity. But most people, unfortunately, are viewed as the IRS as investors and then not able to take many of these deductions. And this is irrespective of forming an LLC or corporation. Any other questions? Other than the loans not being Uh, 
Um, it's taxable to the recipient. It's not taxable to the recipient until he goes to sell it. So, for hypothetical purposes, you bought Bitcoin at thousand, you gift it to him when it's worth ten thousand, and then he sells it the next day because he wanted to go buy a car, and so he sells it at ten thousand. He would have a gain of nine. He would take your cost basis of one, have a gain of nine, and have to pay tax on that. But the actual receipt of the gift is not taxable. Um, he doesn't have to pay any taxes. You don't have to pay any taxes. So does that mean that when you give like crypto to someone, you have to also provide the cost basis? So the question was, when you give crypto to somebody, do you have to provide cost basis? But is it? So it's it's not on that date. So you do not get that step up in basis unless it's inherited. So it's better to pass away with crypto than to gift it during the lifetime if you can do so. Um, but the question then is, do you have to provide that cost basis to the recipient? You certainly should because we've had several clients that came to us that received crypto as a gift and they don't know the cost basis. So what do we do? We don't know it. We got to use zero. And so then you've got a much larger gain. Um, so it's much better to provide the individual the cost basis. Right. No other questions. Okay. Um, how are we on time? All out of time? We are out of time, yes. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all. It was uh, great being here. And uh, thank you all for the questions. Thank you so much, Andrew. It's great and we learned a lot. Thank you very much.